God and renew a right spirit within me. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. And David's prayer. And cast me not away from thy presence, O Lord, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. And renew a right spirit within me. And renew a right spirit within me. And the Holy Spirit, I'm learning more and more, that's all that's going to get us through. There are some crazy information and ideas floating around this world right now. Lord, we pray for the discernment that your Holy Spirit gives to be our light, that light that guides our path. Ah, Tuesday prayer. My, my music team, our music team, did this one. And I know a couple of people here that just do a lovely job of the uh, desk cant part, the hallelujah, hallelujah. So if you feel up for it, in between the verses, we'll do the, that um, for seek ye first the kingdom of God. So Matthew 5, 6, 7. You know, if you ever find yourself getting way out there in doctrine, just go back to Matthew. It'll soon bring you back to square one. The basics, the simple basics of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So seek ye first the kingdom of God. And it may, the verses may be a little low, but that's because the alleluia part gets a little high, so... So we'll just do the best we can, all of us together. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on, kids, sing it. shall be given unto you. Ask, and it shall be given unto you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and the door will be opened unto you. Hallelujah, hallelujah. That 
proceedeth from the mouth of God, singing hallelujah, hallelujah. sounds so wonderful. There is just nothing like the joining of voices with that common faith. Sorry, I was buzzing there a little bit. So, children, would you guys like to come up to the front? I got a couple of ideas. We were having so much fun with stand up and shout it, if you love my Jesus. But Miss Margaret was telling me, come on up, don't be shy. Miss Margaret was telling me that you guys have been talking about Jesus. So I was thinking maybe we'll save stand up and shout it for another day. Hang on, I'll set this down. And um, the kids had some interesting answers, and I think it's something for all of us to think about. Who is Jesus? You know, Jesus asked Peter in the Bible. Um, but I think a lot of adults and kids need to give a little more thought to who is Jesus. So we're going to sing that song Lord, I lift your name on high. Maybe I should stand up. Come. Come on. Come on, you guys. I need you to help me with the actions, okay? Remember this song, Lord, I lift your name on high? I love this song because it's kind of the gospel in a nutshell, and it's for adults and kids, okay? So I'm going to set my microphone down. Thank you, Jesus, for coming. Thank you, Father, for sending him. Thank you for leaving us your Holy Spirit to get us through until Jesus' return. And with that, I believe that we are ready to open our eyes and our ears and our hearts for this message. And Lord, we thank you for Rob and Ruth coming, Rod and Ruth coming. And uh, yeah, really, really get excited about church really get excited about hearing the message and seeing how the spirit is really working in this place. So, preach it, brother. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you very much. It is good to be here. Amen? amen? All right. Nothing like a good amen in church. That is awesome. 
We have had a couple of weeks that have uh, taught me that I am actually getting old. We, uh, we had a 60th birthday for my wife, and if you look really close, you'll find that she's getting younger, and I'm getting older, and uh, <laughs> you have to do, sometimes you have to be very politically correct, and uh, I'm, I'm learning that as I get older. Part of the reason I'm getting older is that I haven't been very politically correct. <laughs> And so it works. But we had uh, last weekend, we had a whole kind of bunch of people came through our yard over the course of the day. It was a come and go birthday party. And uh, my, my kids were all home and the grandkids were all home. And then my kids went home, but uh, my, my daughter-in-law and our, and our granddaughters stayed here for the week. And so we had a full week of uh, time with three granddaughters there all the time and our one other granddaughter was there to join them and uh, I am played out but I am ecstatic. What a joy to have granddaughters. It is pretty cool. So we, uh, we've had a good time and it's been great. But I want to talk to you this morning about, I want to take you on a little trip down history lane. And I'm going to cover a whole lot of time in a really short period, so you'll have to kind of hang on and, uh, and work to stick with me. But there's been, there's been a, a major shift that has happened in our culture and in our society over the last hundred years, but more specifically in the last 20 or 30 years, this shift has really become obvious and really evident in th- what we see around us and in, in our culture, in our, in our country, and in our, our continent of North America. And this shift has happened to the point where a lot of us are kind of wondering, how did we get here, and what has happened, and what is happening in our country? Most of us here were born into a culture that was kind of, for the most part, guided by reason and by logic. That's kind of what we were born into. It, it, was, it was already changing when we were born, it, those of us here, but most of our culture for our lifetime has been guided kind of by reason and by logic, and, and we've been happy with that. We grew up understanding that there was absolutes that governed the way that we lived and the way that things functioned around us. There was actual objective truth that kind of governed the way life happened. We understood that we were responsible for and we were accountable for our decisions and our choices and we were kind of expected to, to live in such a way that, that my life would actually help out the greater good of my community. And we all kind of understood that and we accepted that and that was part of how we grew up. But as we've been moving along in our contemporary society, things have changed and I think we can, under, we can all agree that things have changed. Um, our society and our culture has actually rejected that idea of absolute truth. That has been rejected. And our entire existence, the fact that our entire existence is governed by laws and principles and truths that don't change, that's been rejected. Our culture has kind of put that off and we've said, no, we don't agree with that anymore. And our changing culture today denies that there are aspects of reality that are are objectively true or false and that we can know anything in an absolutely certain way. Society has said, no, that is no longer relevant. That's from yesterday. And things today are changing to where relativism is kind of what functions and what happens and what that means in a, very simple, in a very simple explanation is that you may have your version of truth, and that might work for you, but your version of truth isn't necessarily my version of truth. And so your truth is good for you, but my truth is good for me. And even though those two truths may kind of conflict at times, that's okay. And that's kind of where our culture is living and how we're functioning Truth is a relative thing. 
And that brought us to a place where our whole North American culture has become very politically correct. Just as I started off with that, we, we've become politically correct because if my truth doesn't agree with your truth and there's conflict there, then I need to be very careful that what I'm saying doesn't actually offend you because if there is no such thing as absolute truth, then nobody has the right to say that my way is better than your way. And so as we move along like that, political correctness becomes the way we function. I can believe what I want to believe, but I need to make sure that when I speak out and when I talk about what I believe, that I don't offend you because you may not believe what I believe. And I don't have the right to tell you what to believe and what is right and wrong because there is no right and wrong. There is no true and false. There is no acceptable and unacceptable. That's the society that we're living in. We're, that's where political correctness comes from because we've rejected the idea of an absolute truth that governs everything. That's our North American culture. But that whole political correctness has kind of morphed and changed as well to the point where our whole culture, the culture as a whole has kind of decided, and it's kind of, it's kind of unofficial, it's not a written down thing, but our culture has begun to decide what is acceptable and not acceptable. And not only what we say, but in today's day, what I think and what I value may or may not be accepted by the culture as a whole. And when I say things, anybody who thinks or values outside of these socially acceptable kind of boundaries is met with kind of the outrage of this morally offensive thing that I've said in our culture goes into an outrage that I would have the gall to say something that the majority have said that's not acceptable. And so now we, have, we live in a situation where even what I think and what I value is kind of being policed by the majority of, the comp of, of our culture. Do you kind of get the, f the flow that's happened here? We've put off truth. We've said, no, there is no absolute truth. And so the, then we went to a place where we said, now I need to be careful because there's no absolute truth. I need to be careful that I don't offend you because your truth may not be my truth. But then we've gone to a place where is the culture as a whole has decided that, that because there is no absolute truth, anybody who thinks differently than that and speaks of something that actually hinges on absolute truth, you are very offensive. And all of a sudden we have this culture that is just in this morally superior outrage that you would be so offensive as to say something that would offend my sense of what is right and wrong. And it's actually all your fault. And so you and I now have to become very careful what we say and what we think and what we value because in this, in this offended culture that we live in, this culture of offense, we live in a place where our culture demands tolerance of each other's viewpoints. But the word tolerance has really changed. Tolerance used to mean that you and I would kind of be patient with each other when we disagreed and when we had different values or we thought differently. You, we would tolerate each other. We would, we would kind of patiently put up with the differences and we would accept the fact that there's differences, but we can move on together. We can actually function like that and it's okay. But tolerance doesn't mean that anymore in our society. Tolerance means now that when we have differences, it's actually up to you to embrace my thoughts and my values and you need to celebrate my values. That's what being tolerant is understood to mean now. Not that we just kind of be patient with each other and put up with differences, but you need to embrace and celebrate my thoughts and my values, and I need to embrace and celebrate your thoughts and your values, 
And if I don't do that, then I am suddenly met with a very intolerant moral outrage in our society. That's what is happening. The most intolerant people in the old-fashioned state of the word are the people who are jumping up and down and asking for tolerance. <laughs> Isn't that strange? But it's, but it's because tolerance, the word tolerance and the thought behind it has actually changed. And so this journey that we've been on of our change in culture and the change in the way that we accept values and thoughts and truth or, or, or acceptability has brought us to a place where if tolerance does not happen, it's met with completely intolerant moral outrage by the majority who have become actually experts at being offended. <laughs> We're expert offendees. We, we are absolutely professionals at being upset and offended by the things that happen around us in our culture. And much of, much of our social identity is even determined by what, what group of people we actually tag along with as far as what they're offended about. <laughs> Have you seen that happen around you? We, it's a really strange and, and goofy time that we live in because everybody is offended about something. And my identity in my community is actually starting to be determined by who I am connected to in their offense or in their protection of those who are perceived to be offended. It's a, it's a goofy time to live. But offense is actually becoming the key part of our culture. We are, we are experts at being offended. Part of what is really kind of disturbing to me as a Christian leader is that this mentality that flourishes in our culture has actually been adopted by lots and lots of Christians. And it's actually flourishing within the church as well. I don't know if you've seen that or if you've been aware of that or if you've kind of witnessed that, but it actually happens within the church as well, that we have become kind of professionals too at being offended. I have my expectations of what should be happening within my church. I, I do. I have whether I want to admit it or not, I actually have some expectations and I have values and I have my thoughts about what should happen. And then when it doesn't happen, I'm actually upset to a greater or lesser degree. I'm, I'm upset because my church isn't functioning the way I think it should. And then I'm not sure what to do. I don't know how to handle that. But we handle it very differently in the church. We handle it much more spiritually we, because we are, we are spiritual people. And so when, I, when I'm offended in the church, and y you probably wouldn't do this, but what I've seen happen is that when I'm offended, I actually go to a brother or sister and I, and I voice my, my, my concern in the version of a prayer request. You know, I, this is what I see happening and I really think we need to pray about so-and-so, or we need to pray about this issue, because I'm, I'm not sure that this is really good. I'm not sure that this should be happening within our church, or I'm not sure that that person should be doing that, or I'm not sure that this is right, or it's not the right style of music, or you can kind of fill in the blank. But we, we approach it from a perspective of, we really need to pray about this. And so then, we, as we share those concerns... In, in our kind of spiritual response to being offended, we find that there are some people that don't really agree with us, but there are some people who actually do agree with us. And so then we, act, we, we begin to form these unofficial little groups that, that we, we are going to kind of monitor this and see what happens. And we become this little group that is concerned about these issues. And we, we pray about it. Whether or not we actually log any time praying about it is, is sometimes a different issue, but we are concerned and so we're praying about the issues. 
And eventually what happens is that something, there's some event or something that is said or something that happens that actually kind of quote-unquote proves that we're right. And we kind of stand up and we say, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm very pleased that somebody in this church was mature enough and wise enough to actually see this happening, and now it's come to, it's kind of come to fruition, just like we said it was going to come to fruition, and, and we are officially offended, and we are proud of it. Because we were mature enough and wise enough to see this happening. And we come to a point in the church where we're offended and we are proud of it. That probably doesn't happen here. But, but there are churches where that happens. And it's actually becoming a problem in the North American church. That offense and the attitude of offense has become part and parcel of church culture. I don't know what your, what your experience has been, but in, in my, I've been a Christian for 50 plus years now, and I've seen it happen lots of different times in, in different situations, and I've seen it from different perspectives. I've been one of those who has been offended and I've listened to the prayer concerns, and I've listened, and I've been part of the little groups that are kind of monitoring what is going on. I've seen this happen and been involved from a leadership perspective where we have to deal with the groups in the church that are offended, and I've been involved in churches that just about split because of offense. I've been, I've been involved in, in lots of different ways where you have to deal with the ugly fallout from, from the offense as it's made its way through a congregation. And I want to walk through in this morning and next week, I want to walk through a kind of a, a response as to how, how should we, as a, as a church, as this particular church, as our little corner of the gospel, as our little corner of the kingdom of God, right here in Portage de Prairie, how do we respond to this culture of offense that we live in every day? We go to our job, we meet people at the coffee shop. Well, maybe now we can meet people at the coffee shop again. <laughs> but, but we meet people and we rub shoulders and we interact with people and we, we deal with this culture of offense on an everyday basis. And it's really, really hard not to bring that with us when we come into the church. And it, it shapes the way we think, it shapes the way we respond, because our culture has, has a huge impact on the way that I think, and the way that I feel, and the way that I interact. And Christian or non-Christian, saved or not, sanctified or not, filled with the Holy Spirit or not, my culture impacts the way that I think. And how do we as a church, as a group, as a body, and as individuals, how do we deal with that whole culture of offense? The question that kind of naturally comes out of this is that, am I wrong to be offended? Like, is, is, is it really a big issue if I'm offended about something? Because sometimes we actually need to be offended. The answer is no, it's not wrong to be offended. If we could walk through and live our whole lives and never be offended about anything, then it would mean that I'm some spineless kind of jellyfish type of person that has no values and no sense of what is right or wrong. And if I was that kind of person, then nothing would ever offend me because I don't care. If I don't care, then nothing offends me. But that's a really scary place to be too. So if I have any kind of values, there will be times when I'm actually offended. But any time that I adopt any kind of value system, it will put me in a place where eventually somebody or something will happen or cross my path that has a different value system and I run the risk of being offended. For example, I'll give you kind of a goofy example. I really believe 
over, I'm, I'm 58 years old now. I said I've been a Christian for, yeah, 50 years. I became a Christian when I was eight years old. But at 58, I have come to the conclusion that in this whole war that happens in our society, that Coke is really the drink that you should be drinking. Pepsi is really a second-rate kind of drink. I believe that with all of my heart. And I believe that if you are a born-again Christian, there is no way that you should be drinking Pepsi. Because real Christians drink Coke. Like, that's just, that just goes without saying. But sometimes, I run into people, I run into Christians, actually, who are so deceived that they actually think that Pepsi is good. And I am offended. <laughs> it's kind of a goofy illustration with a little bit of humor. But sometimes our offense is really that simple. It's not really things that are big, big things. You see, the big things are so important that we actually, we, we usually have a handle on the big things. But it's the little things that usually cause lots of offense. I don't like blue carpet. I want brown carpet. And because of that, the church splits and we can't afford any carpet. You know, like that's the kind of thing that happens. But my choice a lot of times as I respond to life is to be offended. And it's like I choose to live with a little stone in my shoe and every time that stone kind of gets in the right place and it hurts, I'm reminded once again that I am offended and that choice or that situation was wrong and I'm upset about it and it just, oh, it bugs me and it bugs me and it bugs me until I get to the point with that little stone that the irritation grows and a process is actually started in my life that can lead to spiritual death. It happens. And it's very disturbing. I don't know if you've had read any, any of uh, John Bevere's books. He writes a book that is called The Bait of Satan, it's all, and it deals with the, the issue of offense. But he says that, that an offended heart is actually the breeding ground of deception. An offended heart is the breeding ground of deception. When I choose to live with an offended heart, I set myself up with fertile ground for the enemy to come in and wreak havoc and to plant all of the evil that he wants because I'm offended and I choose to hang on to that and it sets up a, a fertile breeding ground in my life. And a lot of times the lies and the things that I would never accept, I would never entertain when I'm in a healthy place, when I'm offended and when I'm getting bitter about something, all of a sudden those lies are really attractive and they make sense to me. And my soul becomes a fertile ground for deception. So every Christian needs to deal with this whole cancer Where am I going? There we go. With this cancer of of offense, this cancer that is happening in our life because there's, there's a devastating cost that comes from holding on to offense in our life. There's a devastating cost that happens in my life individually and that happens in the church as a whole, in the body of Christ, when offense is taken and held on to. And every Christian needs to deal with this kind of cancer in their life because the cost is really great. I'm going to talk about two different costs. One I'll talk about today. The other one I'm going to talk about next week. But the first cost that I want to talk about is that this whole issue of, offen of offense and holding on to offense actually affects my state of being forgiven by God. That's a pretty big cost. That's a major cost. This is kind of 
I don't know if I don't know if where where you stop reading when you read the Lord's Prayer, but that's what this verse is. Matthew six verse twelve to fifteen. We say the Lord's Prayer lots of times. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, and we quote it and we quote it and we say it and we pray it together. We pray it in all kinds of different circumstances. And and then we stop at the end, but Jesus' teaching actually continues on in a really, really disturbing way. Because at the end of the Lord's Prayer, he continues on and he says, If you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you refuse to forgive others, your Father will not forgive your sins. That's pretty alarming. When the disciples asked for direction on how to pray, Jesus taught them not only how to pray, but he taught them that forgiveness is actually dependent on forgiveness. <laughs> That's kind of a goofy thing. And I don't know how that fits into your theology of, of what you've been taught and what you've thought through and what you've learned. But Jesus says that the, the principle here is that when God intercepts my life, and he offers me forgiveness, if that mercy and grace that God extends to me doesn't impact me to the point where I actually extend that mercy and grace to the people around me, then God kind of takes a second look. No, 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 that can't be. <laughs> that can't be. But that's what Jesus said. We don't really teach this in the church, and I'm not sure how that fits into, like I said, our, our theology and how we've developed that. But Scripture is pretty clear about this. What I deserved and what I have earned for myself as a result of my sin is death. That's actually what I deserve. That's what I've earned. But the Bible says the wages of sin is death. And so when when. God is dealing with me, what is actually fair and just, perfect justice would mean that I die. That I pay the penalty for my sin and I die. Spiritually and physically, I die. I'm separated from God and I pay the penalty for my sin. That would be perfect justice. Whether we want that or not, that is what perfect justice would be. We don't want actually perfect justice in our own life. I don't, I don't want to pay that price. I kind of demand it in the lives of the people around me. I want to see justice happen, but what I want for me is mercy and grace. I don't know if you can kind of relate to that, but that's kind of, that's kind of how I function. Like, I, I want to see justice in my society. I want to see justice in my relationships, but I want to see mercy and grace for me because if you get to know me, like, I, I actually am not a perfect person. And there's a lot of room for justice to be really uncomfortable. So I want mercy and grace. It says in Matthew chapter 18, Jesus is teaching about this. And, uh, and he says, there's the parable of the king who had this servant who owed him a huge amount of money and he was forgiven. And then that same servant went out and he took another guy that owed him just a little pittance in comparison and he actually threw him in jail. And jail was kind of different back then. There was a debtor's prison that you would actually be thrown into jail and they would make you work and work and work and the wages that you should receive were, were put against the debt that you owed and they were paid to the person that you were in debt to. And once you were fully paid up, then you would be released from prison. It was a, a debtor's prison. And so Jesus says, in that, in that parable, he said, the king called in the man whom he had forgiven so much, and he said, you evil servant, I forgave you that tremendous debt because you pleaded with me. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had mercy on you? Then the angry king sent the man to prison to be tortured until he had paid his entire debt. And then Jesus makes a really uncomfortable statement. He says, that's what my heavenly Father will do to you if you, for, if you refuse to forgive your brothers and sisters from the heart. All of that to say 
that taking offense and refusing to forgive my brother and sister is a really serious issue to the point where it could actually affect my own forgiveness. And I don't know exactly how that happens. I don't know exactly where that all kind of falls into play, like where does mercy come into that? And what I do know is that it's a serious enough issue that offense has to be taken very seriously in the church. And I need to learn how to forgive. There's another chapter, another set of verses that I want to look at. Mark chapter 11, verse 24 to 25. Jesus is talking again about prayer. It's amazing how he talks about prayer and and forgiveness. He says, I tell you, you can pray for anything, and if you believe that you've received it, it will be yours. And he's talking about praying and praying in God's kingdom and praying in the will of God. And he says, if you believe that you will receive it, it will be yours. But when you are praying, first, forgive anyone you are holding a grudge against so that your Father in heaven will forgive your sins also. Sometimes I find myself in a place where I pray and I pray and I pray and it just, and it feels like I'm just going through a mental exercise that really doesn't mean anything. I, d- I don't see kind of big, wild, crazy answers to prayer. I don't feel like I'm really, you know, close to God. I don't feel like God is saying anything Sometimes that's my fault. I believe that sometimes God is just quiet because he wants to do more than just answer our prayer. He actually wants us to pursue him. He actually wants us to, to, to really get serious about pursuing him, and so he's kind of quiet because he wants, he wants to know, like, do I just want an answer to prayer or do I actually want him? And in the context of quietness, that's kind of exposed in my heart, and, and so I have to seek after God. Sometimes that's the case. But sometimes it's the case that, that I have allowed things to happen in my life that are actually affecting my relationship with God. And so when I'm praying, God actually can't hear me because there's issues between him and me. And I'm praying, God, I want you to deal with this situation. And God is saying, but I've actually asked you to deal with this situation. And until you do, I can't deal with this situation. (laughs) It's an interesting journey in parenting when we deal with those kind of things. Interesting watching my kids deal with their kids. (laughs) We have one granddaughter who is just, she is, she's six years old and she is just bigger than life. And she has got energy just coming out of everywhere in her whole being. And I can't keep up to her. And she is having a hard time figuring out what obedience means. Because she's just so full of life and she just keeps on going. And, and it's interesting to, to watch. My, my oldest son was, was a hard kid to raise because he just pushed the limits all the time. And now he's got a daughter that is just like him. And it's kind of really cool to watch. <laughs> Enjoy it. Not that, not, that I'm, not that I'm gloating, but I'm kind of gloating. <laughs> Payback time. But I find myself just like my granddaughter in lots of ways. Because I just want to move forward. I don't want to be bothered with all the stuff. and I, don't, I just want to go. I just want to do it. And so sometimes I get to a place where God says, no, 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 you need to slow down. And there's areas in your life where I want you to deal with. And until we do, we actually can't progress. We can't proceed. You need to deal with these things. When you are praying, first forgive anyone who you are holding a grudge against so that your Father in heaven will forgive your sins too. Please forgive me for falling behind in my... There's another verse, Colossians chapter 3, verse 12 to 13. 
It says, since God chose you to be the holy people he loves, you must clothe yourselves with tender-hearted mercy and kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Kind of a theme. <laughs> but we've talked about the whole thing of sanctification and how God is, the Holy Spirit works in my life to kind of slowly and gently just make me more and more and more like Jesus. And I go through a process in my life as a Christian of putting off this old life that was kind of in, make, that came out of the world. I put off all of those things and I'm putting on the new life. I'm putting on these things that he talks about, mercy and kindness and humility and gentleness and patience. And as the Holy Spirit works in my life, that's what he produces. And that, that whole process is called sanctification. Becoming slowly more and more in my everyday life the way that I am in my position with God, that position I am holy and perfect and righteous, just like Jesus, and I slowly become more and more in my daily life like I am in my position before God. That's what happens when I'm saved and as I grow. But as he works in my life, the Holy Spirit shows me the things that need to change. And he empowers me to actually do what I need to do. If you've been forgiven, the principle is taught here again that if you've been forgiven, that forgiveness needs to extend to the people around you. We need to be people who are known as forgivers people who don't hold a grudge. There are times that I'm offended, and there's times that when we need to work through that, we need to talk about the offense. We need to talk about how things are happening in our relationships. But if we are people who refuse to forgive, that actually is a serious, serious issue in the church and in my life as an individual. That forgiveness needs to extend to the people around me. And that's part of the process of sanctification, becoming more and more like Jesus who died in my place to pay the price that I should have paid so that I can experience life to the fullest. Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and that you might have it abundantly. And a lot of it starts with my choice to extend the mercy and the grace and the forgiveness that I've received. It says in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 to 8, it says, By his divine power, God has given us everything that we need for living a godly life. We have received all of this by coming to know him, the one who called us to himself by means of his marvelous glory and excellence. And because of his glory and excellence, he has given us great and precious promises. These are the promises that enable you to share his divine nature and escape the world's corruption caused by human desires. In view of all of this, make every effort to respond to God's promises. Supplement your faith with a generous provision of moral excellence and moral excellence with knowledge and knowledge with self-control and self-control with patient endurance and patient endurance with godliness and godliness with brother affection and brotherly affection with love for everyone. The more you grow like this, the more productive and useful you will be in your knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Everything that we need to live out this life of forgiveness is made available to us. God has promised us that. So I don't know where you are this morning in this whole issue of, of offense and holding on to grudges. And some of us have legitimately been really hurt. And forgiveness is actually really, really difficult. And I don't know where, where, what your hurts are. Some of you have got hurts that are, that are really, really deep and go really far. And asking you to forgive is a pretty major deal. But not only does God ask us to forgive, he actually enables us to be able to do that as well. 
God never asks us to do something that he won't provide what we need to actually do it. That's where God is an amazing God. He says, be forgiving people, but then he shows us his willingness to forgive, and he actually gave his life so that he could forgive us, so that it could happen. He paid the debt that we should have paid so that he could forgive us. And then he says, you need to forgive those around you as well. And the same power that brought Jesus back to life and out of the grave is the power that resides inside you through the Holy Spirit and is able to lift you up past that pain and past the death and past all the hurt and past all the the things that have happened and be able to extend forgiveness and mercy and grace to the people around you. It can happen. And it's happened time and time and time again over history. On every continent, in every town, in every village, in every place. Jesus is busy saving people and releasing people from the bondage of offense. He's busy doing that. And he can do it in your life. No matter how deep the pain is, and some of the pain is really deep, he can do it. He can set you free. We're supposed to take communion this morning. I want to invite you to communion from that place of accepting forgiveness. Ruth, could I ask you to grab me a communion cup there? I forgot to grab one. And I'm not going to tell you that if things aren't perfect in your life that you shouldn't take communion. I I don't believe that. I don't believe that everything has to be perfect in order for you to come to God. He died for us while we were still sinners. While we still hated him, he went to the cross for us. And God never says, I don't find it anywhere in my Bible, that God says, when you've got it all together, you should come to me. He says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And so as we take communion this morning... What I would like to offer you is that this is a chance for you to be able to make a commitment with your God. To say, Father, I'm not all together. I haven't got all my ducks in a row. I haven't got everything happening. I haven't got everything in place the way that I would like to. But I know that this This wafer represents the the body of Christ that was broken and battered and bruised and busted to enable you and I to come and offer him all of the pain, offer him all of the stuff that has happened. And in that context, you and I can take communion. It says that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, talk about pain and hurt, Three years of investing in a man's life and he turned around and betrayed Jesus for a little bit of money. He gave him away. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body. We don't believe that this is the actual body of Jesus. It's a symbol. It's an emblem. It's a reminder of the body of Jesus that was broken for you. He said, take it And remember what I've done. Remember the cost that I paid for your salvation, for your forgiveness. Take it in my name. And as we take it, if there are things that need to be dealt with, along with the broken body came the empowerment to actually deal with the things that we need to deal with. The broken body of Christ that was broken for you to give you Life in abundance. Let's eat it together. It says in the same way that Jesus took the cup. And he said, this cup is another emblem. It's another symbol of the blood that was shed for us. Life is in the blood. And he gave his life for you and me. And as we drink the cup together, 
we drink to the life that has been given for us and that empowers us to actually move in victory, to move as, in, as overcoming warriors in the kingdom of God, as overcoming soldiers of Christ because the victory has been won, the price has been paid, the blood has been shed, and I read the last page. We win. Amen. We do. We win. And he's coming back soon. And he said, every time that you drink this cup, you proclaim to all the seen and the unseen world the victory that he won. And so this is a celebration of our victory. Let's drink together. Father, I thank you that in your goodness, in your mercy and in your grace, this King of kings, this Lord of lords, this man, this God who spoke and everything that we see around us was brought into being at a word out of your mouth. Somehow you saw fit that each one of us should be a part of that picture as well. Even though you, 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 you created all of the galaxies and all the stars and in the sand of the sea and all the water, you created all of this stuff around us that is so massive, you somehow saw fit in all of that that you needed a Rod Brown. You needed each one of us in this picture, specifically for the purpose of relationship. And so, Father, as you interact with us, as your Holy Spirit interacts with each one of us today, I pray that you would give us the courage, give us the boldness, give us the ability to rise above, just as you said you would, and be people who do not live with stones in their shoes, people who don't live holding on to a grudge, people who don't live holding on to offense like our world is teaching us to do. Our world is full of rage and full of anger and full of this kind of superiority that just seems to be flowing out that I am better than you and my values are better than your values and, and you just be careful that you don't offend me. But we have a Savior who died over offense not trying to punish it, but paying the price for it. Father, make us people that reflect accurately the heart of our Savior and empower us, Father, to be people who are overcomers. And I pray this in your mighty name. Amen. Everything always seems to come together. I, every week I'm always surprised and delighted how what we've been praying about and just things that happen and how it all works out with the message. and Oh, so cool. So anyway, I have, a, I have the message Bible that I like to just kind of refer to every now and then to see how they word stuff. And I had just written this out. And, and right at the end you said... Um, you know, come to me if you're weary and heavy laden. And I'd written this out because I love the way it was worded, where Jesus is saying, uh, it's Matthew 11, 28 to 30, and the way they paraphrase it is, are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me, and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me, and work with me. Watch how I do it. And I love this this line, learn the unforced rhythms of grace. Wow. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me, and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. And I just thought that was so amazing. So thanks, Melba, for passing along this song to me back in the midst of the COVID wintry days. It's just such a wonderful song. We'd like to finish with it today. Jesus now more than ever.
He healed the blind man, walked on the waters, and he raised up Jairus' daughter. He fed the hungry, cleansed the leper, but we need Jesus now more than ever we are sailing in stormy weather all his children should get together for we need Jesus now more than ever he touched the and he started walking he touched the dumb man and he started talking he put their lives all back together but we need jesus now more than ever jesus stormy weather all his children should get together for we need Jesus now more than ever in the book of revelation read about the are heading in that direction only Jesus what can give protection Jesus now Jesus now more than ever we are sailing in stormy weather all his children For we need Jesus now more than ever. Yes, we need Jesus now more than ever.